the final conflict in this age-long controversy between good and evil is over worship. When Lucifer rebelled against God in heaven, the issue was, is God worthy to be worshipped? That was the central issue in that conflict. A rebel angel challenged the government of God. And this rebel angel claimed that God's commands were arbitrary, that they couldn't be obeyed. So the devil began to sow his lies. He began to sow his disaffection. Does God really have the, the angelic being's best interest in view? Is God really loving? Isn't God a vindictive judge and a wrathful tyrant? Satan began to sow those lies in heaven that God was authoritarian, that God's law could not be kept, that God did not have the best interests of his creatures in view. Now, in every generation, the evil one has led men and women to disobey God. He led a third of the angels to disobey God, and they were cast out of heaven. He led Adam and Eve to disobey God, and they were cast out of Eden. But you think about the fact of Adam and Eve in Eden, could it be possible that once it isn't God rather narrow because didn't God say to them, you shouldn't eat of that tree? And wasn't that just a little thing? You look at it the other way. They could eat of every tree of the garden. Every single one God gave them. And so God was not restrictive at all when it came to the freedom that they had of eating the trees of the garden. But that one tree revealed a test, a test of their loyalty, a test of their obedience would they be obedient to God? In every generation, faith in God always leads to obedience. Trust in God always leads to keeping God's commandments. But you look at Israel, worshiping around the golden calf. Again, the issue is obedience or disobedience. You look at Elijah on Mount Carmel, where he calls down fire from heaven to consume the altar where the prophets of Baal entered into their disobedience to God. So in every generation, the test has been the same. Will we be faithful to God and obey him as he's outlined in his word as a symbol of our trust and loyalty to God? So it shouldn't surprise us that in the book of Revelation, the final book of the Bible, that as earth comes to its climactic close, as we come focusing on the last days of verse history, the issue again would be worship. The issue again would focus on loyalty to God and loving God enough to obey God. Revelation 12, verse 17, would you read it together with me, please? And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So the dragon, who's the dragon? How do you know that? Well, the earlier in the chapter, it says, and the dragon is what? Satan. So the dragon is wroth. What's wroth mean? What's another word for wroth? Angry. So the devil is angry with the woman. In Bible prophecy, a pure, chaste woman represents what? The church. So the devil is angry with the church, goes to make war. Did he make war in heaven? Yes. Will he make war with God's last day church? Yes. With the remnant of her seed. What is a remnant? A remnant is the last part of a bolt of cloth that's left over that's exactly like the original. So if you are making a tie like this tie, and you want to give Pastor Martin a matching tie, you have to look for the remnant of this bolt of cloth that's exactly like the original. So God would have a remnant, a last day people, and how are they characterized? They keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So if you're looking for God's remnant, his last day church, you look for a people that love Christ enough to obey him, including all of his commandments. They may not be the largest group in the community. They may not be the largest church in the community. They may not be in the majority at all. But truth never subjects itself to a majority. Truth is not a popularity contrast. Truth is truth whether a pastor believes it, whether a rabbi believes it, whether a priest believes it, truth can stand on its own two legs, right? So here is an end time conflict, a last day war. 
We find this also in Revelation 17, verse 12 to 14. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom yet. Notice how the Bible explains itself. What do the ten, what do the ten horns represent on this beast in Revelation chapter 17? Ten kings or kingdoms. What will happen though? These kingdoms will receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they'll give their power and authority to the beast. So the beast rising in Revelation 13, as I shall show a little later, as many of you are aware, is the papacy. So here the Bible is very clear that the kingdoms of this earth, political powers, will unite with the beast power, a religious power. These are of one mind at a time when the earth is in calamity and crisis, when there is an economic crisis, a political crisis, where there is natural disasters. These are of one mind. They unite. They give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the lamb. Did we read about Satan making war with God's last day church in Revelation 12, 17? Did you read that? Now we're reading about the fact of how that war takes place. Political powers and religious powers unite. These will make war with the Lamb, but the Lamb will what? Overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those that are with him are what? Called, chosen, and faithful. God has called you by his Holy Spirit. You are chosen by God, and God invites us to remain faithful to him. But think about it. He, what a picture in Revelation. Here's a dragon, and this dragon is huge, and he's got claws and teeth, and this dragon's breathing out fire, and here's a little lamb, and the dragon fights against the lamb. Now, if you were logically thinking who would win, who would you think would win if a dragon is fighting against a lamb? Who'd you think would win? The dragon. But who wins in this battle? The lamb battle. Although it appears that God's people will be attacked, oppressed, persecuted, and even killed. The incredible good news is that with Jesus, we're going to be victorious. With Jesus, we are going to triumph at last. Now, in the last days, God is going to demonstrate that his glorious commands are always for our best good. In these last days, we come to a crisis point. We come to a focal point where every human being will have to make their final irrevocable choice. That's why Revelation 22 ends, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. He that is unrighteous, let him be unrighteous still. And he that is unholy, let him be unholy still. So there are only two classes at the time of the end. Right now, there are those that are totally for God, those that are totally against God, and there's a lot of people on the fence. They haven't made a full decision yet. There are those that are living in harmony with Bible truth, but there are faithful Christians that are committed to Christ, but they just don't know the entirety of God's word. So here, in the last days, God's word is shining forth to men and women of every religious denomination, and those of not religious denominations too, and God's word is enlightening them. Thousands are coming to accept God's final truth. The book of Revelation focuses on this end time battle between the Lamb of God and the dragon. Revelation's main theme is the Lamb of God and his triumph over all the forces of evil. Jesus will defeat the principalities and powers of hell. The forces of evil will be crushed. Like James Russell Lowell put it so beautifully in his poem, Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future, and beyond the dim unknown stands God keeping watch above his own. So it may appear at times that the devil's winning in this battle. It may appear that the righteous are oppressed, persecuted, and they will be cast into prison. Some of them may be martyrs. It may appear in this long conflict of evil down through the centuries that Satan is winning. But the incredible good news is that we are on the winning team and that the Lamb of God is going to triumph over the principalities and powers of hell. Revelation speaks of an end time conflict, a union of church and state powers that calls God's end time people to trust him in the face of overwhelming odds. 
So sometimes God allows us to have tests in our life now. Sometimes God allows us to go through dark valleys in our life now. Sometimes God allows us to go through trials. Why? Because he is preparing us for the great test in the future. He's preparing us for what is going to break upon this world as an overwhelming surprise when church and state ultimately unite and when civil laws claim that those that do not stand are disobedient to the government and will face oppression and persecution. So sometimes God allows us to go through difficulties now in our lives so that we'll develop greater faith, so we'll develop greater confidence in God. The central issue regarding the mark of the beast is over worship. Now, let me show you that in the book of Revelation. Revelation 14, verse 7 says, Fear God, that's respect, have reverence, be loyal to obey, give glory to God in your lifestyle. The hour of his judgment has come and has come and worship him who made heaven, earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Do you see the expression, who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water? This expression is an exact quote, word for word, from the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Why should I keep it? For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So when you read this, it's a call to worship the creator, the one that made. It's a direct quote from the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment. So but we keep... We worship the creator by keeping the Sabbath. Now in verse 9, we find in contradistinction, in opposition to that, Revelation 14, 9, then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. In Revelation 15, 1 and 2, it says, the wrath of God is filled up in the seven last plagues. That's not something we want, is it? Certainly not. Now notice, there are two worships here. Revelation 14, 7 says to worship the creator. Revelation 14, 9 says, do not worship the beast. Now, if indeed there is coming a conflict over worshiping the creator and worshiping the beast, if that conflict is coming, as outlined in Revelation, wouldn't God make it abundantly plain what it means to worship the creator and what it means to worship the beast. Wouldn't God make that abundantly plain? If those issues are so critical, if those issues are so important, do you think God would leave that in the Bible a little bit foggy so people didn't know what the mark of the beast is and then they'd receive the seven last plagues? Or do you think God would make it abundantly plain? He has. Now notice, in opposition To those that receive the mark of the beast, it says in Revelation 14, verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. That word saints means believers. Patience is endurance. These people have hung on. They've not accepted falsehood. They've not accepted the mark of the beast. Here are those that keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. Or to make it simple, let's diagram it this way. Revelation 14, 7 says what? Worship the creator. Revelation 14, 9 says what? Don't worship the beast. Revelation 14, 12 says to do what? Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The only way you can keep the commandments of God is if you have the faith of Jesus. So those who worship the creator are those that are keeping the commandments of God. So the issue has to do with worship. What is the only commandment in all the Bible that has to do with worship? It's the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment, right? There's none other that have to do with worship. So here you have clarity in the book of Revelation itself that the issue of the mark of the beast has to do with worship and it has to do with false worship and a false Sabbath rather than the true worship of the true Sabbath. The angels flying in the book of Revelation urgently warn all humanity about this area of true worship. Now let's go back and look at this beast power, try to discover something about the beast, then the mark of the beast, then something about God's mark, the seal of God. In the book of Revelation, 
chapter 13, verse 1, the Bible says, And I saw another beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon the crowns the name of blasphemy. And the, the beast which I saw was like unto his leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon that gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Now, notice there what the scripture says. It describes this beast in Revelation 13. And I've just quoted about the first three or four verses. It says that this beast came up out of the sea. Now, in the Bible, according to Revelation 17, verse 15, the sea represents peoples, nations, tongues. So it's, it's peoples. So this beast arises in a very populated area. In the Bible, a beast represents a king or a kingdom. It could be a political or religious kingdom. Since this beast is worshipped, it must be a religious political power. But notice something about it. He says... It's like a lion. It's like a bear. It's like a leopard. We know those symbols from Daniel. Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece. And then it says the dragon gave him his power, his seat, great authority. The dragon in Revelation 12 represents Satan. But the dragon always works through an earthly power. Remember, it was the dragon, pagan Rome, that worked through the, the dragon, the devil, worked through pagan Rome to kill Jesus when he was born. Roman soldiers nailed Jesus to the cross. Uh, it was a Roman seal upon the tomb of Christ. So the, dr the dragon in Revelation 13 that gives civil power to this new power, this dragon would obviously represent Satan working through pagan Rome. So we know one, notice one thing about this beast power, this religious political power. It has to rise in Rome. We also notice that it becomes a worldwide system of worship. We notice that because the text itself says that. We notice also that it's described as a blasphemous power. Now, often people think of blasphemy as some power that denies the existence of God. But how does the Bible itself describe blasphemy? It says here in Revelation 13, 6 about this power that he opened his mouth to blaspheme against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those that dwell in heaven. What would it mean to blaspheme against God? What would it mean to blaspheme against his name? It would mean that one would consider himself equal to God. What about his tabernacle? How do you blaspheme God's tabernacle? Well, what, what is in God's tabernacle? Well, it's the Ark of the Covenant. What's in the Ark of the Covenant? The law of God. So to blaspheme his, uh, his name would be to consider oneself equal with God, and you must consider yourself equal with God if you try to change God's law in the heart of his tabernacle and those that dwell in heaven. How do you blaspheme those that dwell in heaven? Well, you create images and you create idols. And so what is, what the, what is blasphemy? How does the Bible describe blasphemy? Um, we find this blasphemy again in Revelation 17, verse 13. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. I saw a woman, this is the false church, not the true one, sitting on a scarlet-colored beast. So beast representing the state powers, woman representing the church powers, the church guiding the state, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. In the Bible, you'll find that the Jewish leaders one time accused Jesus of blasphemy. They accused Jesus of blasphemy. Well, why did they accuse Jesus of blasphemy? Because he claimed equality with God and he claimed he could forgive sins. The Bible says that, John 10, verse 33. The Jews answered him saying, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy because, and because you being a man make, made yourself God. So when a human being claims equality with God, the definition of that in the Bible is what? Blasphemy. Now, was Jesus a blasphemer? Was he? Not at all. Why wasn't Jesus a blasphemer? Because he was God, right? He was equal with the Father. He came to earth. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So, so what is blasphemy? Blasphemy then is 
taking the privileges and prerogatives of God. Jesus' claims were true, but when a mortal human being claims the privileges and prerogatives of God as an equal, then that is what? Blasphemy. Now, also, there's another definition of blasphemy in Luke 5, verse 21. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Is God the only one that can forgive sins? Is he? So if a human being claims the power to forgive sins, that, according to the Bible, is what? Blasphemy. Now, the Bible gives you two examples of blasphemy. If any man pretends to be or claims to be God, or if any man claims the power to forgive sins. So the question we have to ask then is, was there a religious political power that rose out of Rome that claimed universal worship that is spread all over the world, whose uh, leader claims that he is equal with God or who claims that he can forgive sins. The Roman church has two distinctive doctrines which the Bible calls blasphemy. The Roman church claims that the power of forgiveness or absolution is vested in her priests by Christ himself. Here's what the church believes. It believes that when Christ gives the ability to forgive sins. He gives that through the church, through the priest. So there's no direct forgiveness directly in Jesus. Now, our message this afternoon, obviously, is a very clear and a very plain message. I was brought up in a lovely Roman Catholic home. I knew nothing about these truths until later in my life when I was 17 years old and began to study the great prophecies of the Bible, attended meetings like this, and it changed my life, totally radically transformed it. When the Bible talks about the beast of Revelation 13, it's not talking about a man or a person. There are many lovely Roman Catholics who God is speaking to and he's calling them out, but it's dealing with a system, a system. Does the church claim by its priests the ability to forgive sins? I'm quoting one of the most famous Catholic authors here, and it says, and he says in this book that has the imprimatur of the Pope of Rome, he says, this is what our Catholic friends say, Seek where you will through heaven and earth, and you will find but one created being who can forgive the sinner, who can free him from the chains of hell. That extraordinary being is the priest, the Catholic priest. Who can forgive sins except God was the question which the Pharisees sneeringly asked, who can forgive sins? I'm still quoting. Is the question which the Pharisees of the present day also ask. And I answer, there is a man on earth who can forgive sins, and that man is the Catholic priest. This is Michael Mueller's book, The Catholic Priest, printed in Baltimore in 1876, page 78 and 79. So he's claiming that. I'm so thankful for what the Bible says. Would you read this with me, please? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, reading together. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. Thank God we need a priest. Thank God we have a priest, and our priest is Jesus. We can come to God, not through an earthly priest, not through an earthly intercessor, not through an earthly intermediator. Why do we need Jesus as our only priest? Well, since the priest himself is a sinful human being, he cannot be our mediator because he also needs a mediator, right? But we have an intercessor. We have a mediator. We have the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there was an article written in the Los Angeles Times, Wednesday, December 12, 1984, and uh, Sunchens, the Times staff writer, headlined the article this way, because the Pope had come out and said, there's no forgiveness directly from God, the Pope says. This was the headline of the article. And the Pope made this point. He said, if you want forgiveness... You have to come to the priest because all forgiveness from heaven flows through the church, through the priest to the believer. So that's the understanding, that there is no forgiveness directly from God. Revelation 13 talks about a power that would claim the authority of God. But Jesus says in 1 John chapter 1, that's verse 9, he, if we confess our sins, he, Christ, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You and I can kneel by our bed. We can pour out our hearts to God. We can know that he will forgive us. 
We can know that the burden of guilt will be gone. We can know that our sins are forgiven. We can know that there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. We need a sacrifice, not the sacrifice of the mass, but the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. We need a priest, not an earthly priest, but Jesus, our heavenly priest. And in Christ, we have all we need. In Christ, we have forgiveness. In Christ, we have mercy. In Christ, we have grace. In Christ, we have freedom from condemnation. In Christ, we have power to overcome the sins that shackle us. The earthly sacrifice of the mass can never substitute for the atonement provided by Christ. He, indeed, is the only one that can forgive our sins. Jesus walked this earth. He walked the dusty streets of Galilee, walked the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem. Here, this this Christ faced every possible temptation that Satan could throw at him, and he came off victorious. He is our perfect sacrifice. He, indeed, is our perfect Savior. He is our perfect high priest. He is the only one that can truly represent God on earth. Does the papal power claim the authority of God? Look, here's another statement by a Roman Catholic author establishing what he believes the authority of the Pope of Rome. The Pope is of so great dignity, this Catholic author says, and so exalted that he's not a mere man, but as it were God and the vicar of God. Hence, the Pope is crowned with a triple crown as king of heaven, of earth, and of lower regions. The Pope is, as it were, God on earth. Now, this is not a Protestant author speaking. This is a, this is a Catholic author who's describing the Pope, chief king of kings, to whom has been entrusted by the omnipotent God direction of the heavenly kingdom. This comes from Lucius Ferris in an article, Papa, in the Prompta Biblioteca. That comes out of Venice, Italy. This is the official description of the Pope by the church itself. Now, Pope Leo XIII urged complete submission and obedience to the will of the church and to the Roman pontiff as to God himself. That was the great encyclical letter, Pope Leo XIII, published in 1903. I was interested in this statement, too, by Leo XIII, uh, issued in another encyclical letter, June 20, 1894, from the Vatican. He said, we the popes hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. So we see that the beast power of Revelation 13, when we're looking at that, gets its authority from pagan Rome. We also see that it becomes a worldwide system of worship. We also see that it fits into this description of blasphemy. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4 will mean a lot more to us now in the light of Revelation 13. Let no one deceive you by any means. In other words, don't be deceived. For that day, that's Christ's second coming, will not come unless the falling away, that's the apostasy, the drifting from truth, comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. The word sin there is lawlessness, the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship. Now notice, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So The Apostle Paul says that this apostasy is going to take place. There'll be a drift from God's plan and his purposes. And we will see this apostasy taking place just before the end. In a variety of symbols, all pointing to the same conclusion, the Roman church is identified as the beast power of Revelation 13 and Revelation 14. It received the seat of its government from pagan Rome. Its leader claimed authority of God. Its priests claim the divine right to forgive sins. Revelation 13, verse 5, though, gives us some mathematical proof. He, the beast, was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. He was given authority to continue 42 months. What is this all about? He's given authority to continue 42 months. In the Bible, a day equals a day. When you read six days of creation, God rested the seven, it's a literal 24-hour period. But when you read the prophecies of Daniel and the prophecies of Revelation, and there are symbolic beasts that are used, then the time periods are symbolic as well. So when it talks about 42 months, what's that talking about? 
In Scripture, each prophetic day equals one literal year. And we read that throughout Scripture. So when you look at Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals a year. We find that in Numbers 14, verse 34. Israel goes up to spy out the land in 40 days, and uh, God says, for every day that you spied out the land, he predicts they'd wander in the wilderness 40 years. They did. Then in a prophecy in Ezekiel, chapter 4, verse 6, read it together with me. I have appointed. Let's read it together. I have appointed thee each day for a year. So in prophecy, one prophetic day equals a literal year. So then how long would this 42-month period be? Well, in ancient times, there were 30 days in a literal month. And if you look at 42 times 30, you get 1,260 prophetic days or 1,260 literal years. How does the papacy fit into that? In the ancient calendars, also the Egyptians, the Hindus, the Assyrians, the Hebrews, they all had 360 days per year. It was later that they added days to catch that up, never changing the cycle of the week, of course. Um, Constantine legalized Christianity in the fourth century. So there, in the days of Constantine, 321 AD, the pagan Roman emperor became a Christian, and he legalized Christianity. As he did that, church and state united. From 321 AD to 538 AD, the Christian church gained power, particularly the papacy gained power. Constantine became very concerned with the empire that was falling apart. So the barbarian tribes were coming down from the north, and what Constantine did was he moved his capital from Rome to Turkey, and he named the capital Constantinople. We call it Istanbul today. And so that's where he changed it. By the time when Constantine moved his capital in AD 330, it left a leadership vacuum in Rome. The Pope of Rome became the leading figure in the Roman Empire. By 538 AD, all of the pagan tribes that had warred against Rome were either defeated. The last of those tribes was the uh, Ostrogoths. And so in 538, the Pope had then filled the void. He became not only a powerful religious leader, but a powerful political force to be reckoned with in Europe. In 538 AD, Justinian, who was the pagan Roman emperor, extremely weak at the time, officially granted the Roman bishop, and you can read this in history, the role of defender of empire, the definer of heretics, the defender of the faith. The last of the barbarian tribes, the Ostrogoths, were defeated. So in 538, you have the beginning of the 1260 years. Many people have said this is the beginning of the Dark Ages, the beginning of the Middle Ages. From 538, 1260 years later, you have 1798. Now, during these Dark Ages, the papacy exercised great influence. Toward the end of the Dark Ages, you have the Reformation that's beginning to take place. But what happened in 1798? What was the significance of that year? In 1798, this prediction was fulfilled. Revelation 13, 10. He who leads into captivity shall what? Shall what? Go into captivity. In 1798, Napoleon looked to the south. And there he saw General, he, 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 there he commissioned General Berthier. Because there in the south, he saw the Pope of Rome getting stronger. And so Napoleon was concerned. 1798, he sent down General Berthier, who took the Pope of Rome captive, and the Pope of Rome died in captivity. Pope Pius VI died in exile the next year in Valencia in France in 1799. Now, it's really a remarkable how the Bible is so accurate. It describes in Revelation 13 that a power would rise out of Rome. The papacy did. It describes how this would become a worldwide system of worship. It did. It describes how that it would be a power that claimed the authority with God and the ability to forgive sins. That exactly happened. It claimed as well in Revelation that this power would last for 1260 years, mathematical proof, 538 to 1798. So we see these prophecies indeed fulfilled. But then the Bible says in Revelation 13 verse 12 that the deadly wound would be what? Healed. So we would see then the papacy rising to international 
international popularity. We would see after 1798, throughout the 1800s, the 1900s, the 21st century, the Pope of Rome, the deadly wound would be healed. He would be jetting around the world, welcomed by tens of thousands. And uh, we see that being fulfilled in countries around the world today, where presidents and kings and queens and princesses meet the Pope of Rome. He came to the United States. President Obama met him there. And, uh, and we see him not only in, in America, but we see him there addressing the Congress and addressing right at the Washington Monument. We see him addressing tens of thousands. He would go into captivity. The deadly wound would be healed. It has not only the Western world, but you look here, coming to Moscow, meeting with Putin and other political leaders there. Around the world, these prophecies indeed are being fulfilled. Now, the latest research on moral leadership finds this, that employees, managers, and executives believe that the great need of the world is for moral leadership. It's more urgent than any ever before. So right now, what do we see happening in our world? We see a lack of confidence in government leaders. We see a cry from the masses, give us moral, ethical leadership. Millions of people wonder, where is there somebody that's morally fit to lead the world? In a world of instability and uncertainty, they say, we need a leader. In a world of rising hunger and increasing poverty, they say, we need a moral leader. In a world of environmental disaster in a growing threat from nuclear weaponry, they say, we need a moral leader. In a time of economic global crisis, they say, we need a moral leader. Could it be, could it be that the devil is getting ready to palm off one of the greatest deceptions ever in the history of humanity? Could it be that we are on the verge of an incredible global crisis where the, economic, the economy will collapse, there'll be natural disasters, that there will be riots in our streets? And is it possible at all, at a time like this, that the Pope of Rome will rise as the greatest moral leader in the world and that Sunday will become a time to unite all humanity together? Is that remotely possible? What vehicle might the devil use to unify society? What vehicle might the devil use to unify all society? Well, let's go back. Have you ever heard the statement that history repeats itself? What did the devil use when the Roman Empire was falling apart? The barbarian tribes are coming down. In an attempt to save his empire, Constantine turned to religion. He developed a political religious system and he passed the first Sunday law in AD 321. And as he passed that law, he passed it to bring people together, pagans and Christians, unified in the worship of God. Could anything like that happen in the last days of earth's history? Might the devil use Sunday as a vehicle to unite people in a time of crisis? Constantine passed the first Sunday law and the church reinforced that decree. Could it be that political and religious leaders would unite at a time of crisis to bring all humanity together? Arthur Weigel, in his book, The Paganism in Our Christianity, page 145. Now, Weigel is a great historian, and he studied these early years of church history, and he said, the church made a sacred day of Sunday. Now, notice God didn't do that. The church did, largely because it was the weekly festival of the sun. Now, this is a historian, not necessarily writing in some Christian book. This is history, for it was a definite Christian policy to take over the pagan festivals endeared to people by tradition and give them Christian significance. In other words, in an attempt to unite paganism and Christianity, in an attempt to save the Roman Empire, Sunday, the first day of the week, became the vehicle to do that as the Roman church and the Roman government united. A common day of worship has the potential to unite the entire world. Since the change of the Bible Sabbath was instituted by a church-state union in the early centuries, worship on the first day of the week 
is a sign of papal authority. It is because the church changed the Sabbath to, com to accommodate or compromise with paganism. To change the law of God, someone or some group must have authority that's falsely assumed to be higher than God's authority. The Church of Rome claims that Sunday is the mark of its ecclesiastical authority. Notice this statement. This is Louis Gaston Segur, plain talk about Protestantism today. So Segur is arguing for the authority of the Pope. He's arguing for the authority of the papal power over the, above all, Protestantism. And he says, thus the observance of Sunday by the Protestants is a homage they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of the Catholic Church. So what Segur is arguing is, since there is no basis for Sunday in the Bible, that in, since it only comes by the authority of the Catholic Church, that Protestants who accept Sunday are really accepting the authority of the Catholic Church. Now, the American Catholic Quarterly Review, January 1883, says this, of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. That's the change of the Sabbath. And the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. So according to the church itself, the mark of their authority is indeed the change of the Sabbath. Now you ask, does anybody have the mark of the beast today? No. Does everybody who keeps Sunday have the mark of the beast? No, they do not. But the Bible does teach us that we are coming to a crisis in our world where Sunday will become the vehicle enforced by a political religious union to unite and save the world. Though no one has the mark of the beast today, Revelation predicts that there will come a time of international crisis. And at that point, the Pope will emerge as the moral leader of the world. The vehicle that will be used to accomplish this goal of world unification will indeed be Sunday worship. Notice what Pope Benedict the 16th said, now this is recent, relatively recent, June 6, 2012. The demands of work can't bully people out of needed time off. Then he goes on to say, Sunday must be a day of rest for everyone so people can be free to be with their families and with God. By defending Sunday, one defends human freedom. Do you see the argument that's being given? The argument that's being given is that if you want to be a defender of human freedom, you want to be a defender of human rights, you want to be a protector of the climate, if you want to be part of one common humanity, you need to worship on Sunday. Now this encyclical goes on to say that the essence of all of this is as governments legislate Sunday. That's what the call is in the encyclical. Now, Notice here as I continue, Sunday is the day of the Lord and of man, a day which everyone must be able to be free, free for the family and free for God. So you see where this, where this is going. If you want to respect human freedom, keep Sunday. If you love your family, keep Sunday. If you don't want climate change, keep Sunday. See, that's where this is emerging. That's why in Europe today you have the Sunday Alliance that's becoming so powerful, pushing so strongly. That's why you have these events taking place in the United States. There's a wonderful statement in the book, Great Controversy, page 592. And it says, those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order, as breaking down the moral restraints of society, causing anarchy and corruption, and calling down the judgments of God upon the earth. Their conscientious scruples will be pronounced obstinacy, stubbornness, and contempt of authority. They will be accused of dissatisfaction toward the government. So you can see how that be could take place. Let's suppose that you had an economic collapse. Let's suppose, and when you look at the debt of America, somebody said, when America gets a cold, the rest of the world gets pneumonia. When you begin to look at the very high debt ratio that we carry, so let's suppose we're trillions of dollars in debt. Let's suppose our economy hangs on a slender thread. Let's suppose that collapses. Let's suppose in addition to that, there are natural disasters, hurricanes, fires, floods. You look at the disasters taking place in Southwest now, Louisiana, the hurricanes, Hurricane Ida, et cetera. You look at the fires in California. That's gonna cost billions and billions of dollars. Then you look at Iran and you look at um, 
the nuclear war capabilities of Northern Korea. You begin to see the battle of, over nuclear weapons. You begin to look at China that's flexing its muscles, its armies are getting stronger. You begin to look at the famines in India, famines in Africa, and you begin to see what if the pandemics of COVID-19, what if you had worse pandemics even than that, that were pestilences that came through? And what if there were decrees that went forth that said, all the world has to get back to God? You know, you can have whatever religion you want, but we got to get back to God. So let's dedicate Sunday as that day to get back to God. As the movement for Sunday, it says in Great Controversy 607, enforcement becomes bolder and more decided. The law will be invoked against commandment keepers. They'll be threatened with fines and imprisonment, and some will be offered positions of influence and other rewards and advantages as inducements to renounce their faith. Now, notice there's a progression here. So first, there are some fines. Then there is some imprisonment. Then there are inducements and bribes and rewards. Then eventually, economic boycott. But somebody says, all of this in the name of unity, it could never happen in America. Protestants would never go along with this. Well, let me show you some interesting things. Does that, do any of you remember back in 1976, some of you are too young to remember that, and those of you too old can't remember it anyway. No. Uh, let's, uh, but re what, what took place in 1976? What took place there? Gas shortages all across America. So... Christianity Today, which is, is really the most famous uh, Christian magazine in America, had an editor at that time by the name of Harold Lin Linzel. And so Linzel comes out with an article, and he said, look, the only way we can solve this gas shortage in America, if we're going to solve that, we need to take Sunday, everybody in America, as a day of worship. We need to do that. And he said, but there's a problem. We won't do it voluntarily. So what does Lindell say? He says, the only way we can accomplish that is by force of legislative fiat through the duly elected officials of the people. So here you have the editor of Christianity Today saying to people, put pressure on your legislators so they will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday so that we can save gas in the economy. That was back then. Now, Notice what Revelation 13, 14 says, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast. So if the beast power is the papacy, if the sign of the papal power is Sunday worship, who's wounded by the sword, but he now lives. He was granted power and breath to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak. Now let's pause there. If indeed the beast is a political religious union, if that's the case, and if indeed beast powers represents nations or tongues, how do nations speak? They speak through their laws, right? That's the way they speak. Should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be what? Killed. Now somebody says, Pastor Mark, these are very serious issues. And these are very serious issues. But I thank God we are on the winning side. I thank God that as we trust Jesus and as we have faith in him, indeed, we can conquer in earth's final war at a time of pollution and climate change, at a time of economic difficulties and ecological problems, at a time when our atmosphere is polluted and our water is polluted. There is a call to come back to worship on the first day. Now you say, but what, if, what about the Supreme Court? Won't the Supreme Court protect the people of God? Let me show you something very interesting. William Rehnquist, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, said this, the wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history. In other words, what he's really saying there is this, when our founding fathers established the wall of church separation between church and state, they were not meaning in any way that religion should not influence the state. They were simply meaning the state shouldn't control religion, so religion should have an influence in the state. See, so that's the subtle argument that indeed is being used. Pat Robinson wrote a book, and Pat Robinson is one of the, the, the leading uh, evangelicals, and he writes a book called The New World Order. And in that book, this is what he said. The next obligation, it's page 236, the next obligation that a citizen of God's world order owes is to himself. 
Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, he's speaking about Sunday, not the seventh-day Sabbath. Is a command for the personal benefit of each citizen. Higher civilizations rise when people can rest and draw inspiration from God. Laws in America that mandated a day of rest, so that's Sunday laws, have been nullified. So he's saying these laws have been, they've been set aside today, they've been nullified as a violation of the separation of church and state, as an outright insult to God and his plan. Now, do you catch what, what, what Pat Robertson's saying? He's saying that we have done away with, in America with those, those old Puritan blue laws, those Sunday laws. And as the result, America's going down, down, down. And so if we want American to rise again, we need to institute those Sunday laws. So I've showed you that I've quoted encyclicals from the Pope of Rome who's saying we need to move toward one day of worship. I've showed you from Christianity Today, Harold Linzall says when the gas shortage came, we need a legislative fiat. We've looked at Pat Robinson who said here that it's an insult to God to not have this one day a week. Only those policies that can be shown to have a clearly secular purpose are, are recognized, he says. Probably one of the more significant letters ever written by the Pope of Rome is the encyclical letter Laudato Si of the Holy Father Francis on the Care for a Common Home, January 18, 2005. Now notice the title is On the Care for a Common Home. This was a major encyclical that just has come out of Rome, actually 2015, where the Pope is appealing to the leaders of the nations of the world. And he's appealing to them largely because he desires the entire world to legislate Sunday observance. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, he says, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. Sunday is the day of the resurrection, the, day of the first day of the new creation, whose first fruits are the Lord's risen humanity, the pledge of the final transfiguration of a created reality. It also proclaims man's eternal rest in God. In this way, Christian spirituality incorporates the value of relaxation and festivity. So what he's saying there, and he goes on to say that this should be prominent before the governments of the world. So what he's really saying is that Sunday is a family day, Sunday is a rest day, Sunday is a day of relaxation. It's a day that can bring the entire world together. But yet echoing down the carters of time, is Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the what? Patience of the endurance of the people of God. Here are those that do what? Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Jesus is appealing to men and women today to be obedient and loyal to him. He's urging us to be sealed from eternity. So in Revelation, you have the mark of the beast, Revelation 13. You have the seal of God, Revelation 7 and verse, and verse 14. So the seal of God stands in contradistinction, in opposition to the mark of the beast. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my what? Commandments. Loving Christ, we receive his seal in our forehead. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit to be faithful to God. Now, seals were used in ancient times to notarize or attest to the authenticity of official documents. How many of you are married? How many married people we have here? How many wish they were married? How many are married and wish? No. <laughs> okay. Now, if you have a marriage certificate, do you have a seal on your marriage certificate? You do, don't you? And what does the seal tell you? It tells you that that marriage certificate is authentic. That's what the, that's what the seal is all about. A seal authenticates a document. Now, in ancient times, they would take a clay seal and it would have the name of the sealer, namely the prince or the king that was authenticating the document. It would have his official title and his territory. The seal would be soft and it would harden. You could take a wax seal, it would be soft. When you and I come to Christ, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. So if you are a Christian, you have received the seal of the Holy Spirit in your life. But that seal is hardening until the day of the final test when you are finally sealed for eternity by Christ. Now, what is the sign of this final seal that prepares us? For what, is, what, what is this seal that notarizes God's 
eternal document. Now remember, the final conflict is over what? Worship. And we find that worship in manifestation in keeping the commandments of God. So do the commandments of God have a seal in them that has the name of the sealer, the title of the sealer, and the domain of the sealer? Now, to be authentic, a seal must contain at least these three elements, the name of the one that's doing the sealing, the title of the one that's doing the sealing, the territory of the individual whose seal it was. Where is the seal of God found? Read with me, please, Isaiah 8, verse 16. Bind up the testimony. Seal the what? Law among thy disciples. So where is God's seal found, everybody? In his what? In his law. And the seal authenticates that law. In the heart of God's law, Exodus 20, verse 8, 9, and 11, it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. So here is his name, the Lord your God. It goes on to say, for in six days the Lord made. He's the maker. He's the creator. That's his, his title. The heavens and the earth, that's his domain. So, the, so, for example, the commandment that says, thou shalt not commit adultery, that doesn't have the name the title and the domain of the lawgiver, honor your father and mother. That doesn't have it. Thou shalt not kill. That doesn't have it. So Satan has attacked God's seal by instituting a counterfeit Sabbath. We have the name of the originator of the seal that authenticates the Ten Commandments, the Lord your God. We have the title of the sealer, the one who made, the creator. We have his territory, the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Revelation chapter 7, verse 1 and 2 do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we've sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. So Revelation 7 pictures the angels of God holding back the major destruction, holding back the strife, the conflict, holding back the economic disasters, holding back the major pandemics that'll come. Sometimes the winds blow through the fingers of these angels, and we see a little bit of that, until the servants of God are sealed in their forehead. In other words, until every man, every woman, every child has an opportunity to make their final irrevocable decision, all for Christ, and step out for Christ, and serve Christ, and the Holy Spirit seals us as we make a decision to be loyal to God in our life, and when that national Sunday was passed, as we make the decision to honor our Creator and worship the Creator and stand for His commandments, we then have the seal affixed in our life. We are sealed by the Spirit of God to go through that time of trouble. Jesus respects our freedom to choose. He invites us to let him shape our minds with the things of eternity so we cannot be moved from the anchor of our faith in the word of God. That's what the sealing is all about. So the Holy Spirit works in our lives now. The Holy Spirit works in our hearts now. The Holy Spirit convicts us now. The Holy Spirit leads us to truth now. The Holy Spirit leads us to obedience now. And as we respond to the Spirit, we are being sealed. But in the, as the final test comes, we stand for Christ then because we've stood for Christ now. We receive his seal. That is to say, in our minds, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit to stand through the conflict. The mark of the beast is received in the forehead or in the hand, indicating that people are either intellectually convinced, that's the forehead, they're deceived, intellectually convinced by the beast, they choose to accept Satan's lies, or they're forced, that's the hand, pressure, against their will. Satan's last deception, fueled by spiritualism at a time of international crisis, undermines the law of God. We're going to see spiritualism take place. There will be signs and wonders and miracles that take place that are false miracles. But God has given a sign. He's given his seal. He's given his mark. The seventh day, Sabbath. Throughout through Sabbath observance, we concede to God his position as creator and accept ours as creatures. We come every Sabbath, we rest in the God that created us. We rest in the God that redeemed us through Christ. Every Sabbath, we come as an acknowledgement to please God. Every Sabbath, we come. And the Sabbath places us in a special position of worship and loyalty to the creator. That's why it's singled out as the keystone commandment. That's why it's the sign or seal of the covenant. For an agreement to be valid, each party has to sign it. God has given us his covenant. We come with a commitment to Christ. We come loyally to follow him. God wants the universe to behold and his people the triumph of his grace. 
He says to us, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Have you ever listened to Handel's Messiah? Isn't it incredibly inspiring? You know, when Handel was writing the Messiah, as he was writing that, he was almost bankrupt. In fact, he was bankrupt. He had uh, so much debt he couldn't possibly, could not possibly pay off the debt. He was so depressed, so discouraged, and he began to write. You know, he wrote the Messiah in about 23 days, and he came across Revelation 11:15. the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. He shall reign, you remember that, forever and ever. He read Revelation 19, 6, and I heard, as it were, the voice of the great multitude is the sound of many waters, the sound of mighty thunder saying, Alleluia, you know it, for the Lord our God omnipotent reigns. He read Revelation 19, 16. He's king of kings and lord of lords. As Hindle read those things, he put his head in his hands and he just wept. He wrote this Messiah score 24 days. He just wept and his valet came in, his servant came in, and he looked up and he said, I think I've seen the very voice of God. I think I've, I think I've heard the voice of God. I think I've seen God. You know, we will go through that time of difficulty, sealed by the Holy Spirit, trusting God by faith, and we'll hang on to these promises. Jesus is King of Kings. Jesus is Lord of Lords. We'll hang on to these promises in Revelation. Alleluia, the Lord our God reigns. Alleluia, oppression may take place. Persecution may take place. There may be signs and wonders by the devil, the evil one. There may be an economic collapse. There may be pandemics. There may be war, conflict, strife. But we will be encircled by the light of God's love and angels. We will be singing, Alleluia. Beyond earth, God still sits on his throne. Beyond what's going on on earth, we're looking to heaven because Jesus is there. He is our King of kings. He is our Lord of lords. And we will sing, Alleluia, the Lord our God reigns. I want to sing with him that day, don't you? I want to sing the praises to him as he streams down the corridor of the sky. Lightning shines from the east even into the west. Darkness covers the earth. The earth rumbles. Christ comes. And he said to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm coming again. Would you like to, to seal your decision with Christ today? Would you like to say, Jesus, I am yours today? We're living in the last hours of earth's history. If you've never made a decision for Christ fully before, I invite you to make it now. Right now, wherever you are. If you've never made a decision to be obedient to him and keep his commandments and keep the Bible Sabbath, I invite you to make that decision right now. Maybe you're right on the verge of being baptized. I had a lady walk into our Living Hope Church this last week, and she said, last Sabbath, she said, Pastor Mark, I want to be baptized. We have so many people. I talked to another lady on the phone watching our YouTube videos. She said, Pastor Mark, I want to be baptized. Many who have drifted away are coming back. I want to invite you right now to make one of three decisions. If you've never accepted Christ, I'd like you to bow your head right now and as I pray and say, Jesus, I want to accept Christ. If you've never before made a full decision to follow his truth wherever it leads you, or maybe you've made that decision, you've heard the Sabbath, and the light of the truth has dispelled the darkness in your life, I want you right now to say, Jesus, I'm going to do that. And if you want to look forward to baptism or rebaptism, write to us at Hope Lives 365. Contact us. We'll pray with you. We'll help you in that decision. Let's pray. Father in heaven, right now men and women are making eternal decisions. They are coming to you. And I just pray that you'd guide them, that you'd strengthen them. Seal them by your Holy Spirit. Prepare them for the crisis that's coming. And enable us, each one, to have the motto of our lives, the same motto that Jesus said, I'll do always those things that please him. Help us have one desire in life, and that's to please Jesus. In Christ's name, amen. I want to thank those of you who are supporting this ministry. 
Many of you support us with prayers. You're praying for this ministry. Others of you are supporting with free will offerings. And if you're interested in that, there's a place on the website you can donate. Or if you so desire, you, do, you make out your check to Hope Lives 365. You send it to Living Hope at uh, 5235 Merchants View Square, Haymarket, Virginia, 20169. I want to thank you for enabling us to go to the world. We have many of our videos will be 100,000 views. Some have gone 500,000 views. Some have gone a million views. We have anywhere from 500,000 to, to 2 million people watching every month. We are in over 100 countries. So you're part of something big for God, part of something grand for God. And I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for helping to keep this ministry going, to help to keep it alive, and to help us be able to preach Jesus and his truth to the ends of the earth.